Fifty years ago, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldwin descended to the moon's surface in the lunar lander Eagle, the first humans to touch a new world. Really, the most important part of that mission was landing. And when we landed, and I said, uh, contact light, engine stop, and a few other things, and then I patted Neil on the shoulder. After what seemed like an eternity to ground controllers in Houston, Armstrong uttered the words etched forever in history. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Between July of 1969 and December of 1972, 12 men walked on the moon, and then it was done. Over. Half a century has passed, and no one has been back. No one really cared to go back. There was no need. America's first space shuttle, and the shuttle has cleared the tower. The U.S. turned its attention to developing and flying a reusable space plane, the shuttle, and at the same time sending probes and landers to Mars. Since Apollo, humans have spent more time studying Mars than the moon. It seemed logical, like the red planet would be the next place humans would plant boot prints. People are no longer asking, uh, should we go to Mars? They're asking, how do we get there, you know, and how quickly can we get there? Uh, and I, I, I think we're inside 20 years. That may be true, but in what seems a fairly sudden course correction, the moon, not Mars, will be the next stop. Call it deja vu if you like. Humans are going back to the moon and then on to Mars. Why? Simply put, Mars is hard, and it's a long, long way. The moon is a three-day trip. Mars is six months. Jonathan Ward is a space historian and author. There is so much more that we have to kind of prove closer to home. You know, once you, once you start sending a rocket to Mars, you've, you've got those people committed for several years. There's no turning around and coming back halfway there. It's, uh, people are finding out that it's better to try to test those technologies here closer to home. So I think that's maybe what the, maybe it's a dose of realism that's coming in here. The learning curve is steep. How do you build a base on another planet? How do you live and work there, not just for a few days, but weeks and months? How do you protect from long periods of exposure to radiation? Find and make water, grow crops. It's now quite possible that within a decade, China, Russia, along with the United States and its partners, will all have humans walking and working on the moon using the lunar surface to figure out what it will take to mount a Mars expedition. By the end of the 2020s, we will have at least landed people on the moon again. Um, as to whether we'll have a permanent presence there, I don't think so. I think we will probably have, at, at best, have sent a lander there with four people and maybe spent a couple weeks and come back again. This renewed interest in the moon, and to a larger extent, just flying in space, has become infectious. India is planning to use a massive rocket to put three people in orbit by 2022. Russia wants to build a new spacecraft called Federation to send its cosmonauts to the moon by 2028. The Japanese space agency, JAXA, is working with Toyota to build a rover that can carry two astronauts across the lunar surface. Israel is landing a small probe on the moon later this year, and the United Arab Emirates is sending one to Mars next year. And China is moving steadily toward landing its people on the moon by the end of the 2020s. China has already put a lander and probe on the moon's far side, something no other nation has ever done. As a nation, they think it's really important. Now, granted, they may think that one of the things that's important about it is it gives them an opportunity to supplant the U.S. as the leader in human spaceflight. And I think that's great. They should want to do that. Every nation in the world should want to replace us as the leader in human spaceflight. The U.S. space agency NASA has grand plans, too. It wants to build, along with Japan, Canada, and its European partners, a small space station called the Lunar Gateway to orbit the moon. Spacecraft with astronauts, supplies, and scientific experiments could travel back and forth between the station and the lunar surface. 
and NASA is only a couple years away from flying its massive new rocket, the SLS, Space Launch System, with the Orion spacecraft, which could deliver crews to the Gateway. But maybe there's no need for a lunar gateway at all. Commercial company SpaceX, founded by billionaire Elon Musk, is developing what he calls the Starship, which Musk boasts will take people directly to the moon and eventually to colonize the solar system. There could be some natural event or some man-made event that ends civilization as we know it, and or in life as we know it. And so it's important that we try to become a multi-planet civilization, extend life beyond Earth. Japanese entrepreneur Yusaku Meizawa has booked a trip on Musk's starship around the moon in 2023 for himself and a half a dozen artists. What is less clear about all these moon expeditions is who's going with whom. Right now, it appears all these nations are, to put it this way, doing their own thing. Given the billions of dollars it will cost to land humans on the moon, that makes little economic sense. I strongly believe that's that's the kind of thing that's going to have to happen. I mean, I think you see the Europeans are are happy to do that. They've got a couple astronauts mm -hmm. actually in China right now who are learning Mandarin uh, with the understanding that maybe they would be able to eventually partner with the Chinese. The former NASA administrator Charles Bolden says China may use its own space station modules to start nurturing new relationships. They want them to be human tended. So they want to put some experiments on the modules, come back six months later and check them out. That's a sustained low Earth orbit infrastructure that I think we need. And that, you'll find that there will be some corporations, some companies, materials processing, pharmaceuticals, you name it, that are going to say, we want to go work with the Chinese. Because we hate having astronauts on a treadmill or doing stuff that's shaking the vehicle when we're looking for six months of quiescence. Because you can't get that with humans on board. There are other signs of evolving space partnerships that could reshape the future. Next year, the Europeans working with Russia, not the U.S., are sending a lander and rover to the Red Planet. NASA is sending its own Mars 2020 lander and rover. China is planning to send its first ever Mars orbiter and rover. While the moon is the proving ground, Mars remains the ultimate payoff. But I Robert would Zubrin, still like it to be renowned aerospace engineer, engineer, author, and Mars exploration advocate, so the crew believes that payoff is being delayed by wasting time going back to the moon. The human spaceflight program needs a goal. That goal should be humans to Mars. It should be humans to Mars because Mars is where the science is, it's where the challenge is, it's where the future is. Okay? You know, it's where the science is, it's where we can discover the truth about the potential prevalence and diversity of life in the universe. You can't do that on the moon, and certainly not in lunar orbit. But before humans go to Mars, there may have to be some transformational technology allowing them to get there faster. Enter Franklin Chung Diaz. The former NASA astronaut flew on the space shuttle seven times. A visionary, he spent more than 20 years on his dream of developing a revolutionary propulsion system that shoots out a stream of eons and electrons to produce thrust. When he left NASA, he formed the Ad Astra company, which means to the stars. But before the stars, there's Mars. And Franklin believes in his lifetime, he will see his rocket engines take humans to the red planet. And it won't take six months to get there. How about six weeks? That's right, six weeks. Chung Diaz believes his rocket technology should be matured and ready about the time humans are in a position to actually go. This is an effort for the entire globe, entire human race. So it will be an international uh, mission and hopefully um, countries like India, China, United States, um, Europe, and all the major uh, industrial countries will be key players. Ultimately, getting off planet Earth is, Franklin says, an absolute necessity. His vision for humanity is a species that is spread out across the galaxy, taking root on planets, orbiting distant suns. We're doomed, Chung Diaz believes, if we do not venture outward. We don't want to damage this planet to the point that we can't live in it. We want to be able to move out and expand before the planet is too, um, you know, uh, too contaminated. 
and so that the Earth eventually would become, becomes humanity's national park. A place where we can always come back, that is beautiful to see where we came from, but we don't really live here. This is where we came from, but we live elsewhere. I think then we will assure human survival. Franklin's vision is of course generations away, but what happens in the next decade may lay the groundwork for that vision to become reality. And it's all starting close to home because the future of exploration is beginning again on the moon.